this is really what I want to talk about, and it's really my whole slide. Uh, this is, this is uh, a combination of evolution and natural history. And uh, I have uh, thought today that we might demonstrate this better, uh, in no better way, than to have two patients here. One is a daughter, and one is a mother. And they came to see me this, during this last week in my clinic. And I'd like to take a few moments to, uh, to uh, examine them in front of you. And then uh, we will go on later to make the, try to make the diagnosis of their kyphosis. This is a woman who now has reached uh, a uh, senior age of 75 plus and came today, because, came to the clinic because she's having pain in her back, pain in her uh, buttocks, and she really puts her hand right to her posterior thigh and buttocks. And she notices, and her family notices, that she's lost a lot of height, and she's lost the inability to, uh, to walk uh, in any stand-up way. However, she compensates for it. And first of all, I'd like you just to walk back and forth a little bit, if you could do that. You could just walk over and back. Okay, and come back. Thank you so much. Now, I want to demonstrate one thing, and that is that if I, if I get down and really hold her leg, hold her knee back, and try to do that, and then try to stand up. That's the best she can do. Now, I'm going to do it in several directions. Can you turn sideways here to the crowd? So if I pull her knees and try to straighten her knee, now try to straighten up as much as you can, Ms. Lee. Can you okay. So that, that's the maximum she can go. And these become, uh, which I think is a very important part of the exam because of the compensation one can make with their knees. Can I have you bend forward now as though you're going to touch your toes? And I think that in the exam, one notices the increased kyphosis, generally of her thoracic uh, spine. Come back up. And now, could I have her daughter come up? And I'd stand the other way. So I thought this is probably one of the better demonstrations of a generation and what happens. So if I let her stand with her knees bent, we do it that way. If I hold her down so that she has to bend forward, bend, straighten your knee out all the way, then she forced forward, and then she comes back. So there's a difference in height of approximately four or five inches. Could that be generational, or is it really the long future for this woman? Who knows that? We don't know that answer. So, uh, and so we're here today. So I think that this picture shows really where we started. We started about in uh, Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, according to the archaeologist uh, and the anthropologist, and we were on all fours. And we stood up, and as we stood up, we, uh, we then had bent knees, bent hip, and we finally uh, learned to straighten out our hips, straighten out our knees, and then we, uh, we end up way over there on the right side, somewhat like where we started. And what is normal posture? That becomes the question. And uh, I think that we've come to have some normals. The normal thoracic kyphosis is probably somewhere from 20 to 45 degrees. And the lordosis is somewhere to 40 to 60 degrees. But we all recognize patients who have extremes of those. This is uh, Bridwell's work where they idealize parameters of balanced spine. And I think if you drop a plumb line, you can realize that we are, in fact, looking at a line that comes up the femur, goes through the uh, pelvis, goes through about L2, and runs up to C7. And I think that's the ideal um, uh, posture, and we can call that the sagittal vertical axis. In scoliosis, we have the same collapsing problem. And uh, again, we have to define whether it's in the thoracic area or the thoracolumbar area or the lumbar area. But this change in posture with age is very interesting. We all have a profile. We actually know all our friends. We know all of our parents by their, by their posture. And it's very interesting how much, how important, it, uh, what important part it plays in recognizing people. And uh, if we, these are some of the very more, the more subtle things.
your hips become, are, uh, become further back as you start to lean forward and you start to put more pressure on, your t on the forward part of your foot rather than the heel because you're trying to support or, or resist the uh, kyphotic changes that are going on. This is a uh, postural change looking at what's been known sort of as youthful posture or military position. And then you have this, uh, this gradual change that's uh, occurring. So what are the causes of this postural change? Well, we have a, certainly we have osteoporotic fractures that can occur. Perhaps a lot of this has to do with the musculature of our spine and the forward and the inability to actually extend our spine. Then there, there is the fear of instability, and people don't want to fall backwards. So they tend to lean a little forward in order to stabilize themselves. That may play a part in this. And then of course, there's a loss of thoracic discs, the loss of the lumbar lordosis, and hip flexion contractures. So this is the same person 35 years later. And, uh, and so again, the natural history. So how can we assess the deformity of uh, degenerative disease? Well, I think that we have to look at what is different about the adult degenerative deformity and what is different about the adolescents. Certainly in the adult group, we begin to have spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, rotational subluxation, lumbar lordosis, and thoracic kyphosis. The uh, Scoliosis Research Society has uh, made a classification for adult deformity, but basically I'm going to uh, mention the things on the left. The global balance is what I've been talking about before. Then the regional deformities are the kyphosis or scoliosis that can occur in the, uh, in the thoracic or lumbar region. And, uh, and then often uh, we have to add fractures as a very focal problem. Now, the historical factors are that pain is certainly part of what brings patients into your office. And they, uh, they, are, uh, they are associated with this position. So the question is, why do they have the pain? And it becomes part of a very complex formula. And we're looking at uh, muscle fatigue. These people have trouble with forward gaze. They are helped usually by getting a cane, which will bring them back up. And very often they come to you because of the cosmesis of this problem, which they are very upset by. And I only bring these pictures because the forward gaze becomes a problem for some of the patients. And as they stand, they, have, uh, they will have sometimes a loss of lumbar lordosis, and, uh, and then this forward gaze, which is a cervical problem. And we can address that later. Also remember, when, when trying to determine where the kyphosis is, you have to very specifically examine the patient because in this case, the kyphosis is clearly a thoracic problem. The scoliosis problem becomes complex because of the shoulders and because they also have a collapsing uh, spine. And so in order to evaluate these, I think that the long x-ray is really the best way. Unfortunately, with the new digital x-rays, we're having more and more difficulty getting true long films. But uh, I think it's still a very important part. And I think they have to stand with their hips and knees in, uh, with their knees in full extension and then, and then asking them to stand as straight as they can. And the proximal femur has to be included on that film and the uh, and as you do that, you develop a global look at the patient. So this picture shows that if you draw a line, uh, a line up the femur, let's see, this line that runs all the way up the femur can be uh, extended, and then the line needs to be developed that goes from, the, uh, from uh, S1 up to approximately C7. Those two lines become a, an important line. And then you can measure really how far forward that patient is. And that angle becomes very critical of, in the uh, thought of how you're going to correct the spine. So if you draw this line, you have 42 degrees. And that 42 degree angle 
is what it would take to bring that patient to a neutral position. Now, it may be that you need more than neutral, but that's how long, that's how far it would be. And this picture was, uh, was the result of some work by one of my fellows looking at, at how much correction it would take at different parts in the spine to correct the uh, patient. Because if you make a correction in a thoracic area, it would take 56 degrees to correct this person's uh, posture. Whereas if you can make the correction down at the L5-S1 level, 26 degrees of the same correction, of correction will bring you to the same spot. So the farther down you can make the correction, the better. So here is a, a patient who's 62, and you say, I can draw, you can I'm almost after you've done the x-rays enough, you can look at the patient and begin to draw these lines in your head and understand how much correction it would take to, uh, to really help them. This is this person who has 35 degrees uh, angle at the bottom and has a scoliosis with nine centimeters unbalanced to the, uh, to the right. There's a lot of work that's being done to assess the, the pelvis. And I'm not going to get into that, but there's this pelvic incidence discussion and it really has to do with how our pelvis is tipped and whether this plays a big part in spondylolisthesis. Uh, but in fact, all of these numbers don't help you as a spine surgeon because I think the numbers I gave you for the global look become really what is important to straighten up if you're going to straighten them up as a spine surgeon. There are some other choices. If you lay the person down, this is really recreating the old Thompson test where you laid someone down and you can, you can again assess uh, the problem. The problem could be in their hips, could be in their pelvis, could be in their lumbar spine, but at least you will measure the angle that you need to make the correction. This is the patient we saw today and who's sitting in our front row. And as I pull back on her knee, she is, uh, she is unable to stand up. It would appear clinically that looking at her that this is, this is someone who needs about 35 degrees of correction. If I bend her knee, then she can stand up and look forward. So in assessing them, I think this is a very important part. Well, one of the things you can do before you get to her is to examine her lab test. In this case, the femoral neck is, three, is minus 3.3 as a T uh, score. So there's, that immediately alerts you to the possibility that this well could be a collapsing uh, kyphosis from uh, fractures. And remember that the spine is often very degenerative, and if it is, it gives you a false reading of being higher because you have all the osteophytes giving you a higher T scale there. So you have to really look at the femur to do this. So then you take a picture of her thoracic spine and you see that she has three compression fractures that are occurring. So, so this thoracolumbar kyphosis in this case is, is certainly augmented by these, uh, by these fractures, but it doesn't look like enough to account for her entire posture. So you look in her lumbar spine and you see that she's developed significant stenosis at L4-5. And so spinal stenosis becomes part of the diagnosis. Could she in fact be standing this way because of her stenosis? And then finally, this is her hip, which is all degenerative. And that's why this woman is standing the way she is. So in assessing this person's kyphosis, I think this is primarily a woman with a hip disease, needs to get her hip operated on, and she will gain back at least 20 degrees of her, uh, of her extension. So like with ankylosing spondylitis and with any arthritis or with degenerative arthritis, my point today is you have to examine the patient globally and look for what might really be causing her overall kyphosis. So kyphosis is a global condition. The physical exam should be done with a high index of suspicion, looking for hip disease, degenerative lumbar disease, spinal stenosis, loss of lordosis, associated scoliosis. Look for compression fractures in the thoracic area, especially. Look for cervical kyphosis, which can also accompany this, and for the osteoporosis for the collapsing spine. So I thank you today and uh, thank our patients who came. Thank you.
Thank you, Ted, and thank you very much for the family for coming in. We'll now move on to uh, the cardiopulmonary and nutritional aspects, the, uh, the soft tissue surroundings of the spine here, and uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, head of pulmonology at Children's, uh, Dr. Redding. I'm going to talk about cardiopulmonary more than nutritional impacts of spinal deformity, and I'm going to focus really on very young children and on thoracic deformity per se. Uh, we've become uh, partners. And pulmonologists and orthopedic surgeons, particularly with very young children, are now increasingly discussing how to manage patients. And when I talk to pulmonologists, I tell them the spine dictates rib function. We know that from mobility studies with kyphoscoliosis. We know the ribs dictate spine function. A good example of that is fused spine or fused ribs and how it leads to scoliosis or worsens it. We know the lungs dictate spine and rib function. And the best example I know of that is children with diaphragmatic hernia or unilateral lung hypoplasia and up to 18% of patients will subsequently develop scoliosis just by virtue of that. And the take-home lesson for us as pulmonologists is the ribs and spine now dictate lung function. And, and I think that's always been in the literature, but it's, it's re-emerged with new technologies to intervene. And more importantly, I think we're dealing with a very young population that has complex chest wall and spine deformities. And most importantly, they have years of somatic growth ahead of them. And you've heard a little bit about progression over time. And in the children that we're dealing with who are now two and three years of age with these deformities, we have lots of time and lots of growth ahead of us. And the issue is how do we take that into account with our therapeutic decisions? Now, what I've learned, how, I've learned how to be humble around you guys. And the reason is because every time I look at a spine, uh, I'm asked, what are the functional correlates of what I see? And the spine is incredibly complex. And if you think of spine and thoracic cage as being a combination of an abnormality, you have scoliosis and kyphosis and rotation, all of which you've heard about this morning. You have severity based on degrees that sometimes are easily measured and sometimes not. You have the side of the deformity. You have the length of the deformity. You have the distortion of the chest wall uh, and associated rib abnormalities. And then importantly, you have rate of progression, which obviously dict uh, dictates when you're going to intervene and differs with different combinations of these structural abnormalities. My job in this situation is to try and figure out what the pulmonary functional consequence of all these are and how do you correlate one of these, two of these, three of these with uh, a particular respiratory abnormality. When you look at this, most of you look at the white. When I look at this, I look at the black. When you look at these, you say, how is it built and how does it move? When I look at it and I say, how far can you run and will you get really sick if you get a cold? The important thing is how we look at the same creature the, uh, differently and how we mesh those assessments. And I would submit to you that it's very difficult to assess function simply by looking at this structure. You have a high suspicion something's going to be wrong, but exactly what that is and how bad it is is something that's unclear and needs to be measured. We think about pulmonary function and consequences of spinal and thoracic deformities in terms of these domains. And these have been by uh, uh, intuition more than anything else. And one of the things we're trying to do right now is to interrelate these abnormalities among themselves as we relate them to the structural problems that you encounter. So I'm going to talk to you about respiratory mechanics. I'm going to talk to you about excursion, because we're now learning devices to, uh, using devices to measure this. Uh, asymmetric lung function, right versus left lung, and how that influences subsequent outcome, and inefficient diaphragmatic function. So when I look at a patient, these are the terms that I'm using, and these are the domains I'm considering on measuring. If I think about restrictive respiratory disease, it's really a loss of lung volume as the chest wall distorts. And when you have loss of lung volume, you have loss of distensibility. And loss of distensibility or stiffness means that you have to work every time you take a breath and work more than the normal person. You have loss of rib mobility, and we understand that uh, excursion in the lateral uh, dimension as opposed to the diaphragm constitutes about a third of every breath. This is position dependent and, and more important, ironically, uh, when you lie down than when you sit up. Uh, but if you lose rib mobility and lose excursion, you're losing a proportion of tidal volume, not to mention vital capacity when you get sick. And I think importantly, you increasingly rely on the diaphragm. This is an important concept because I th talk about the, the kids that I take care of as turtle kids. They've got a shell. You guys modify that shell. You may even make the shell bigger. But whether the shell moves or not is very important to me. And if it can't move, where do you move such that air goes in and out? And so children who have increasingly rigid th thoraces end up having more reliance on the diaphragm. And if that goes awry, then they die. If you look at the degree of restrictive lung disease we see, 
This is just an example from some of the patients we, we've taken care of with uh, thoracic insufficiency syndrome, and you can see from uh, just these numbers that it's about 56% vital capacity. The important concept I want you to remember is that you reach your maximum lung function at about age 22. You start declining at about age 35. And when you start thinking about the significance of a 50% lung function, that may be fine if you can maintain it until the child's 22. By the time they're 40, they're going to be losing some of that 50%. So longevity is influenced. We also have ways of measuring this now in babies. They're called infant lung function testing. Uh, they require sedation, um, but look for the center that you have nearby that is able to do that to measure this in children. The other consequence is that when you have increased respiratory work, that transmits into use of calories. So you use calories to breathe, and therefore not calories to grow. And the consequence is that we have nutritional issues and uh, about half of the children, not quite half the children that we see for consideration of orthopedic surgery for congenital and infantile scoliosis, we, have, we place gastrostomy tubes in them to maximize their nutrition, to minimize their postoperative complications, particularly as you put hardware under their skin. We use arm span instead of height because height is spurious based on the curvature of the spine, and therefore we use the modified uh, body mass index using uh, weight per arm span, and we follow that. There's the pinch to inch test, which clinicians use, which is, a, a, I would say, a crude estimate of whether or not you're going to get in trouble postoperatively. Many of these kids have delayed surgery because we have to improve their nutritional status before we ever consider uh, an intervention. Uh, Bob Campbell's talked about uh, the windswept chest. Here's an example of it uh, using CT, and here's a three dimension of that. This has pulmonary consequences. Uh, first of all, you develop asymmetric lungs and lung volumes. And second of all, what we think is very important is you start using one lung more than the other. Uh, we used to think we could predict that. You cannot predict that based on concavity and convexity of the curve in the thorax. It doesn't relate. And what you end up doing is relying increasingly on the one diaphragm rather than the two diaphragms when you have increasingly reliance on one lung instead of two lungs as the asymmetry progresses. We test this with lung scans. So rather than lung volumes, we're looking at how much air goes in and out. You can do this with a lung ventilation scan or a lung perfusion scan. The nice thing in children is, is that uh, perfusion scans don't require uh, voluntary efforts. So if you have children who are going to refuse to help you in ventilating xenon gas, what most people in the country have started doing is lung perfusion scans because ventilation and perfusion match very well. You've got to remember this is an encasement disease and not a primary pulmonary disease. And so where you breathe and where you perfuse in your lung match pretty well, and you can assess relative function of the left and right side. Now, this may have implications in terms of which side you decide to go on. If you have a kid with a 90-10 split and you decide to go in on the 90 side, you may have post-op complications. So all of a sudden, this may influence how you decide to go in and where and how long. This is an evolving concept, and I want to bring it to your attention only because it will be different next year, I think. Uh, if you take all the children that have um, spinal deformities with thoracic uh, abnormalities and consequent pulmonary changes, what we find is that probably lung mechanics are influenced first. And people don't mind that. They just use a little extra energy to breathe. They then lose lung excursion. And then they become increasingly diaphragmatic dependent and abdominal dependent. And somewhere along those lines, in terms of the unknowns, we know that you become more active, you breathe faster, the stiffer you become. Uh, as you increase your work to breathe, eventually you fail to thrive. And what we're now doing is trying to look at when this kind of uh, enters into this inverse pyramid in terms of sequences of abnormalities. Now, I realize the reason this is important is that at some place you're going to want to know where along this continuum a child is that walks into your office. And where is this child in terms of how bad is he? How do you measure badness, structure-wise, function-wise, nutrition-wise? And what are his trends such that you intervene earlier instead of later? And lastly, we know there's respiratory failure. Unfortunately, that's not very common these days uh, in about 5% of the children. The last thing I want to talk about is the diaphragm, because I think this is going to be a very important area that we learn more about in the future. You have to realize that the diaphragm works as a piston. And so this flat part of the diaphragm really doesn't have much function. It's the placement of this flat part that dictates how well you can breathe in. The working part of the diaphragm is in the vertical areas right here and here, which are called the zone of apposition. And as these contract, your diaphragm pulls down, so it's like a piston. Now this becomes very important when you start to think about how the chest wall distorts, how the chest wall and spine distort this vertical uh, configuration and the strength of diaphragmatic contraction.
And if you look at this, which is just a subtraction CT of a child with scoliosis, and I want you to focus on the lower parts of the lung, this is a normal lung, and you can see how the diaphragm actually has curvature. Uh, you have a nice lip right here. Uh, contrast that with the other side. There's really no zone of apposition here. This is a flat diaphragm that just goes like this. So it doesn't contract, and so not surprisingly, it doesn't function. And so how diaphragms are aligned, how they are modified by curvature in any dimension is something we're interested in studying right now. The reason this becomes important is if you look at the people who go into respiratory failure, it's the people who don't generate force with their diaphragm. And if you distort the diaphragm, if you rotate it so that it can't contract in the normal vertical direction, then no matter how strong it is, if it contracts and doesn't move the diaphragm, doesn't have excursion, you can't ventilate. And the consequence is you develop respiratory failure and require ventilation. The last thing I'll just tell you about, because I think this is a continuum for children, and where we're trying to, again, associate the continuum of functional abnormalities with the continuum of structural abnormalities, so we can make some useful decisions about when to intervene and when's the best time to change the structure of the chest wall, is by looking at these domains together. And what's important here is that even though you get restrictive mechanics and there are outcomes for people who have restrictive lung disease, you don't often get restrictive mechanics using one lung, which is what happens as you rotate. And if you're now using restrictive mechanics with one lung and your diaphragm goes bad, how well do you do? So what's the threshold by which you begin to, to intervene earlier? And I think this is where we're going and trying to give you projections on <laughs> rational decisions. All of this progresses with the chest as you grow. So you have progressive disease, which we have to take into account and measure trends. And what we're trying to do is measure the loss of functional reserve rather than how you do when you sit and play the radio. We want to know how you play when you play soccer and not how when you play video games. And that's what's going to happen when you get sick is you have to run. And so measuring that functional reserve is very important because we want to preserve that as a child continues to grow. I thank you for your attention. Thank mm -hmm. you.